What would Disneyland look like? What would it be without Sleeping Beauty Castle, the park's crowned centerpiece and icon? When people think of classic Disney parks, the castle is one of the first images conjured to mind. It may be hard to believe, but this little castle used to be the tallest building in the park and visible up to three miles away. It's one of the company's greatest assets and served as a symbol of the Disney brand across the world. Walt's original plans for his Mickey Mouse Park in Burbank didn't feature a castle, but somewhere along the lines, as the plans grew more elaborate, some of the artwork began featuring labels mentioning a castle, although the size in which it would be was not clear. It's likely the first ideas would have been for a small structure similar to a fairy tale castle on a miniature golf course. As plans for the Mickey Mouse Park grew into Disneyland, the sprawling 60-acre theme park that would be built in the orange groves in Anaheim, the size of the castle grew with it. The Imagineers at WED considered different castles from the list of animated movies. These castles didn't fit Walt's idea. Instead, he assigned Herb Ryman to design a castle from scratch. But each time a new design came up, Walt shook his head. There was even a brief idea that they would not use a castle at all, but instead use a building that was reminiscent of a castle. Walt had once expressed why it was important that the castle be built. He thought of Disneyland as a living place, a place designed to draw you into adventure as opposed to passively displaying it for you. He wanted guests to see a visual icon at the end of every walkway and would pique their curiosity and make them want to walk further into the park. And while the train station on Main Street would entice you through the entrance turnstiles, the castle would be the centerpiece of the park that pulls your attention past Main Street and makes you want to explore deeper. He called these visual icons a weenie, referring to when you get a dog's attention by waving a tasty hot dog at them. There is a misconception that the budget for the castle was cut down because Walt was running out of money, but actually it was one of the few projects to which he spared no expense. To him, it was the most important structure in the park. Herb Ryman did research on several European castles, trying to draw inspiration for a whole new castle of his own. The biggest inspiration for the Fantasyland icon would come from Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria. And this design would represent a structure towering nearly 160 feet high. Now, Walt Disney liked the design, but then came a new worry. What if the castle was too big? The last thing he wanted was for visitors to be intimidated by a grotesque monster of a building. Walt had explained that the castle would need to be significantly smaller in order to fit with his idea of Disneyland being small and intimate. And indeed, the redesign of the concept better reflected that feel of quaint intimacy. Imagineer Fred Jurger went ahead and built a model of the castle. It was designed in separate sections so it could be taken apart and examined more closely. Herb Ryman and his team came in to inspect the model before Walt showed up. Everyone seemed to like it, except Herb himself. He thought it looked strange. Herb picked up the top half of the model and turned it completely around so the backside faced the opposite way. Fred protested this, saying, Herbie, stop that. Turn it around. Walt's going to be here any minute and he's not going to like it. But it was too late. Walt Disney walked into the room, asking to see the model. And when he looked at it, he realized it didn't look like the drawing. Walt thought for a moment, then responded, Hey, I like that better. Let's do it that way. The castle was constructed like a modern building. The soil was compacted, then a foundation of concrete was poured over it. Then a sparse skeleton of steel beams and rods were installed to give the structure a strong and flexible backbone. However, most of the structure would be made of wood, from there, the walls were framed with wooden studs spaced apart, and boards were nailed in diagonally. Over the lumber, they installed moisture-proof sheets, and then they began the tedious work of installing a wire lath and spraying stucco. The stucco was then sculpted to give the illusion that the castle walls were made of stone blocks. The footage shows that some of the castle turrets and portions of the towers were actually constructed at ground level inside the Main Street Opera House and then transported to the construction site and installed using a crane. Those white corbels were molded out of fiberglass, a relatively new construction material at the time. 
The only other use of fiberglass on the castle was the rooftops, which appeared to be made of standard wooden shingles, but were instead molded fiberglass that was placed on top of a wooden framework. During construction, Walt's older brother, Roy Oliver Disney, was examining the model of the castle and asked about the finial caps on top of the spires. Walt said, they're gonna be made of 24 karat solid gold. Roy disagreed, saying that making the finials out of gold was an expense that they couldn't afford to waste money on. But Walt insisted that the castle had to look the part of royalty. Using gold would give the castle a more regal appearance and give people something to talk about. However, Roy continued to say no. Walt realized his brother wasn't gonna budge on the subject. There was only one thing to do. Walt instructed his people to install the gold finials anyway, but not to tell Roy about it. One of the architectural design elements of the castle that I love is something not often talked about. One day, author Ray Bradbury was visiting Disneyland and stopped by the castle. Bradbury was actually a close friend of Walt's and also knew many of his Imagineers. He noticed that the castle's chapel looked rather familiar. It resembled the backside of Notre Dame, complete with the spire. He went to a payphone and called Imagineer John Hench and asked, John, how long has Violet Le Duc's spire been on the side of Sleeping Beauty Castle? Hench replied, 30 years. Ray Bradbury realized he had never noticed it there and wanted to know who put it there. John Hench said, Walt did which begged the question of why he put it there. Hench simply answered, because he loved it. Disneyland's opening day was fast approaching, and Imagineers were spread thin since they were often working on more than one project at a time. There wasn't even time to consider the paint job of the castle. A color scheme was quickly thought up, and instruction was hastily given to the painters. It was a color scheme that would haunt the castle for 50 years. The time had come to give the castle a name. During this whole period, the working title was simply the Fantasyland Castle. And in fact, even on opening day, it would often be referred to by that name. But everyone at WED knew the castle had to belong to a storybook character. Well, at the time, the studio was working on the animated feature Sleeping Beauty, though it wasn't expected to be released for another four years. When Walt suggested the castle be called Sleeping Beauty Castle, there was a fear that if the park or the movie had failed, the name would be tarnished. But Walt Disney insisted that both the park and the film would be a success. It later turned out that the park was wildly successful and the movie was not, but the name wasn't tarnished. Opening day had come and guests flocked around the castle, snapping up as many pictures as possible. Roy Disney had seen that Walt went behind his back and installed the gold finials but after hearing guests refer to the castle as beautiful and elegant, he didn't bother Walt about it ever again. The castle had its working drawbridge pulled up at first, but was ceremoniously lowered when a knight on horseback demanded, open the Fantasyland castle in the name of the children of the world. While everyone who laid eyes upon Sleeping Beauty Castle found it enchanting, Walt felt the structure was rather useless it was literally nothing more than an oversized park decoration. There was a lot of unused space within the walls of the castle, and indeed, whatever space there was available would be tucked into odd shapes and divided by support beams and walls. Still, Walt confidently tasked Imagineer Ken Anderson to lead a team that could develop a use for the space. He insisted that the castle not waste its valuable real estate. You have to understand, this was no easy task. The castle stands only 77 feet tall. Only the first 25 feet had enough headroom for walkable space. Then the Imagineers had to contend with the fact that the structure doesn't have much depth. Areas that looked like they could house a family were really only a closet space. To further complicate the matter, the structure wasn't designed for walking space. The interiors of the castle were like a maze. And so, Ken decided on creating a walkthrough attraction that told the story of Sleeping Beauty. Artist Ivan Earl, who was working on the backgrounds and landscapes for the movie, was commissioned to create the artwork for the sets of the walkthrough so that it would match the film. Ken had found enough room inside the castle's towers and turrets to fit 11 dioramas alongside a narrow walking path. Cleverly tucking the vignettes away in corners that most people would deem as useless, 
The main hall of the attraction was located on the castle's second level, and it needed structural reinforcement to handle the weight of dozens of people above it. Thankfully, the additional reinforcement was able to be hidden into the design of the newly constructed gift shop at ground level, which further added to the usefulness of the park's icon. You can see here that Ken and his team had to enclose parts of the castle that were otherwise open to the elements, and even build hallways in areas where they didn't exist before. But the impact to the castle's appearance was minimal. The Sleeping Beauty Castle walkthrough opened on April 29, 1957, with a small ceremony featuring a ribbon cutting by Walt Disney and Shirley Temple, who was already an adult at the time and was dressed as a princess. For the cost of 20 cents, guests could climb the stairs up into the castle, see the beautiful dioramas, and exit with a commemorative souvenir booklet. The castle's appearance remained relatively the same throughout the 11 years that Walt Disney walked the grounds of Disneyland. The only change came when a slight pink hue was added to some of the upper walls, but mainly, little thought was given to drastically improving the color scheme. Sometime between June and July of 1965, the Disney family crest appeared above the drawbridge entrance to the castle. The first major change came in 1977. That decade was an odd one. People of that decade often saw the art and decor of previous decades as unsightly. The guests even thought the beautiful Ivan Earl artwork in the walkthrough looked dated. And as with most things in the 70s, the walkthrough was changed. The dioramas were redone to look more three-dimensional, with sculpted scenery as opposed to the flat pop-up book style that it previously wore, and the characters were designed to look like dolls. Many even thought of them as oversized Barbies. Some of the dioramas were motorized, but ultimately, while people of the 70s loved the new look, the people of later decades would wish to erase that change from history. When Fantasyland reopened with a fresh new look in 1983, Tony Baxter wanted to commemorate the opening by having guests watch the drawbridge lower for them. He and his team examined the nearly 30-year-old mechanisms and confirmed the drawbridge could still be raised and lowered again without trouble. In 1991, the dioramas were updated with new special effects and modern color schemes, but even still, the sculpted sets and doll-like characters remained. For Disneyland's 45th anniversary in the year 2000, the castle's rainwater runoff spouts were redesigned to look like squirrels from the animated film, a small touch of magic given to the park's icon. Then on September 11, 2001, the nation experienced the tragedy of the terrorist attacks, which resulted in the deaths of over 3,000 Americans. Many landmarks in the United States were on the list of major targets. Disneyland and Magic Kingdom Park were on that list. Whatever the reason, the walkthrough would be shuttered for half a decade. In 2004, Disneyland was undergoing a complete refurbishment project to prepare itself for the 50th anniversary the following year. This meant completely refreshing the color scheme of the castle and adding new decorative touches. The finials of the structure, which were degrading after five decades, were completely replaced with identical replicas and also made out of gold. The climbing vines, which were allowed to grow up the sides of the castle, were removed in order to update the color scheme of the stone blocks. On top of these upgrades, temporary decorations were overlaid onto the castle, giving it a look of being adorned with crowns and bunting. And in a most controversial move, the paint scheme was updated so the pink hues were much warmer and more vibrant, and the original blue fiberglass rooftops were repainted with a glossy teal paint scheme. The corbels and framing stonework were repainted with gold hues to reflect the castle's golden anniversary. In 2007, Imagineer Tony Baxter saw the re-release of Sleeping Beauty on Blu-ray home video as an opportunity to regenerate interest in the abandoned walkthrough. He and his team came up with ideas to return the walkthrough to its original Ivan Earl design, but with modern special effects. The project was green-lighted and when Imagineers went to examine the state of the walkthrough after having been closed for so long, they found nearly a dozen feral cats had taken up residence inside the dioramas and halls. The cats were given veterinary care and released back into Disneyland. The Sleeping Beauty Castle walkthrough reopened to delighted fans and visitors on December 5, 2008, 
And due to new standards for ADA compliance, the Imagineers took a page from the revamped submarine voyage and decided to install an alternate experience at ground level for guests who couldn't climb the stairs. They can relax in a themed room and view the walkthrough experience on a screen. In 2014, the central walkway leading up to the drawbridge was given added railings designed to look like they were made from wrought iron and bronze. Though the company was not required to do this to meet Cal OSHA safety standards, they did the work voluntarily. The next change came in 2015 for Disneyland's 60th anniversary, when the warm pink color scheme of the castle was toned down. Temporary overlay rooftops, which were decked out with plastic jewels and were designed to light up with LED technology, but during the day, their sky blue color and reflective banners advertised the park's diamond anniversary. Unfortunately, when the sun hit it just right, it was blinding. Another change that happened during the time was the addition of projector towers on either side of the castle. At first, they might seem intrusive, but when you see them from another perspective, they appear like quaint little watchtowers. But the rooftop decorations for these anniversaries weren't the only ones. Every Christmas since the 50th anniversary in 2005, the castle was adorned with overlay rooftops that looked as if it was covered in snow and icicles. This annual changing out of rooftops started taking its toll on the old fiberglass. Not to mention, the harsh Anaheim sunlight and dusty summers had faded the colors and added grime to the roofs. Disney had seen the dents, cracks, fading, and dirt, and decided that the 60th overlay roofs would remain on the castle until there was money to fix the problem. However, that money wouldn't be made available until 2019, when Project Stardust was underway to freshen up the park in time for the opening of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. With Disneyland's 65th anniversary happening in the year 2020, the company wanted their original castle to really shine. Imagineer Kim Irvine, who was raised and mentored by original Imagineers, was given the job of refreshing Sleeping Beauty Castle. The highest priority of this refurbishment was the installation of new rooftops to replace the originals. She drew inspiration from one of her Bryman's concepts and also kept in mind something that John Hench felt strongly about. He always told her to push the color, insisting that she not be afraid to add vibrant color to things. What she designed was a new look that paid homage to the castle's original concept but stayed true to its own. Indeed, the castle was unveiled in 2019 and showed vibrant new stonework, pastel colored pinks, and deep blues. The central rooftop was adorned with golden sparkles of pixie dust, while the spire rooftops faded in color the higher up it went, so as to give the illusion of the towers being taller and farther back than they really are. Not everyone agreed with the new color scheme, feeling that Kim Irvine should have taken a more traditional approach, but she defended her work by quoting John Hench. Kim said, John Hench often walked by it, and he would say, we've got to fix that color scheme. An architect did that color scheme. It should be so much more, you know, colorful and bright. Indeed, Sleeping Beauty Castle was not meant to look realistic. The Fantasyland Castle was meant to be a fairy tale structure, something to represent a castle straight out of a storybook, as if it leapt off the pages of your imagination. For the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company in 2023, new iridescent decorations were added to help celebrate the milestone. A century ago, it would have been hard to imagine that one day, the company would be represented by this structure. But it is now as much a part of the fabric of the company as Mickey himself. This building is much more than some fake fairy tale icon. It was designed by artists, people of real emotion, of real feeling, and love. It's a monument to imagination and a testament of modern art and architectural ingenuity. It continues to tower as the tallest structure in the park not designed to look like a mountain. And with every child that passes that drawbridge, and with every adult who follows, we are again reminded of that realm of fantasy beckoning us from beyond the magic portal enticing us to follow our storybook heroes into adventures that await us in the welcoming arms of the happiest kingdom of them all, Fantasyland.